day when I, when I did. Uh, I was tired and sort of exhausted. I thought maybe it would make more sense to go back and do that again in a hopefully clearer way. Um, let's make this a seminar and not a colloquium, please. So that means you can interrupt me and uh, we can discuss uh, the ideas that are taking place. If I had to rename this seminar, I, I called it FRWCFT or something like that. Here it is, let's see. FRWCFT or maybe FRWM. What does M stand for? Anybody know? It stands for what it always stands for. Absolutely. <laughs> you got it. But sometimes it stands for matrix. Uh, and other things, mother, mouse. Um, but if I was actually to rename it, I would rename it the emergence of time. Now, that's a very pompous and pretentious uh, title. And I'm only talking about the emergence of time in one very, very, very special particular context. Uh, we have lots of examples from string theory where we say that a dimension of space emerges in this way or that way, and people are puzzled over the question of whether time can emerge in some similar way. One of the ways that space dimensions emerge, and maybe the, uh, the most well-known, um, I don't know if it's the most well-known, but well-known, is through renormalization group flow in ADS-CFP. Renormalization group flow in the CFT side of things corresponds to motion along the radial direction of the uh, anti gasita space. You probably all know that. That's another example of a space dimension emerging out of formalism without being put in, so to speak. Uh, the question has arisen over and over again. What about time? Why can't we make time emerge? I'm going to show you an example of which time really does emerge. But it's in a very spe specific cosmological context, slightly unrealistic, but not grossly unrealistic. So uh, three titles, FRWCFT, maybe FRWM, and maybe something about the emergence of time. OK. So let me start with the sitter space, a very, very, very quick, uh, just to remind you. What is the sitter space? The sitter space is a hyperbolic geometry which begins very big, shrinks down, and then bounces and goes back out. The uh, scale factor exponentially grows in the past, and both the past and the future. Strictly speaking, the scale factor is proportional to some cost of time. And it can be embedded as a hyperboloid in, uh, in an extra dimension. So if we have four dimensional the sitter space, uh, five dimensional embedding space, it would look about like that. We can take that geometry and analytically continue it, which is a useful thing to do, analytically continue it to the Euclidean um, uh, signature. And what does it become? It becomes a simple sphere, a four sphere in the case of four dimensions, embedded in, you don't have to embed it, of course, but you can embed it in the five dimensional uh, background and it just becomes a sphere. Another description of, uh, the sitter space is through its Penrose diagram. Let me take the Penrose diagram in two parts. Uh, first, slit this down the center and open it up, lay it out on the blackboard, and then compactify it by a conformal transformation. When you slit it and open it up, uh, it has the structure of a rectangle. Of course, the top of the rectangle and the bottom of the rectangle are off at time like infinity and time like negative infinity, but then you compactify it, forms a rectangle, and uh, in fact it forms a rectangle which is twice as wide as it is high. That's close to being the Penrose diagram. What I'm thinking about, of course, is taking this two-dimensional hyperboloid and laying it out. We're not really talking about a two-dimensional hyperboloid. This is, strictly speaking, not the Penrose diagram of anything, because the Penrose diagram, strictly speaking, would identify the point over here and the point over here. And so this would be the official Penrose diagram of the sitter space. And uh, the sphere over here, both the sphere and the hyperboloid, have two poles, uh, the left pole and the right pole over here, which map into the left 
I'll call it pole of the hyperboloid and the right pole of the hyperboloid over here. Those correspond to these two edges. And time like infinity, time like infinity, this is it. And that's a rather well known description of the sitter space. Now I want to go to the diagram or the pictures which represent the Coleman de Lucha decay. Uh, I like to double. I, it's a bad thing to do. You shouldn't really do it. But I like to double the, uh, the Penrose diagram and lay it out as if it were two-dimensional and lay out the whole thing. I'll do the same thing with the coleman de Lucha geometry. The coleman de Lucha geometry is for the purpose of studying the decay of the city space, or the decay of uh, any metastable vacuum. So we imagine we have some potential. This is just a simple uh, cartoon of some very vast landscape, but some potential which has a metastable minimum that I'll call from now on A for ancestor. Think of it as the vacuum before our own. And then a vacuum with lambda exactly equal to zero. That's, that I want, that's the thing I want to study, the decay to a state with lambda exactly equal to zero. Of course, I'd love to study the decay to a vacuum like ours with a small lambda. Uh, but I don't think we have the machinery to do that. I think we have the machinery that allows us to study the decay to a, sta to a state with lambda equals zero. And presumably, that means a supersymmetric vacuum over here. Uh, I don't think there's any reason to believe that there are any vacuums of string theory which have lambda equal to zero, except those which are exactly supersymmetric. So I'm studying a model, then, of a decay from a point on the landscape with a sizable vacuum energy to a state where on the moduli space of uh, vacuums and zero cosmological constant. Oh, Raphael, I, I couldn't see you. No, no, there's an instant time for it. Uh, the machinery, which I'm going to explain. We certainly have the machinery to calculate the rate and that sort of thing. No. Um, the, the machinery to construct a, uh, a holographic description of it. Okay, to do what I'm going, what I'm, the, the thing I'm going to do, uh, to give what I think is a precise uh, description of, uh, of the quantum mechanics of the system. All right, so you start, you start with the vacuum being an A. That's over here. In this picture here, the time uh, in the uh, coleman Belucha instant time calculation will flow from A to this end over here. So you start at A over here, and then you tunnel through this region, which I've represented by red. You tunnel through at the point. Here's where you tunnel through, on the domain wall. The tunneling region here happens very quickly. And for my purposes, I'm going to be taking it to be practically instantaneous tunneling from, uh, from the de Sitter to lambda equals 0. And lambda equals 0 is in here. The Euclidean description of a lambda equals zero vacuum is just a flat plane. A four, this, of course, all has to be uplifted to four dimensions, but uh, you can picture that. And this is the Coleman de Lucha instant time flowing from the ancestor vacuum to the lambda equals zero vacuum over here. All right, now to construct the Minkowski continuation of it is a little tricky, but it's not very hard. What you do is you start with the section at t equals 0. t equals 0 maps into itself when t goes to it. So t equals 0, the waste of the diagram over here maps to, the, to, to t equals 0 in the Minkowski sense. Start over here at the pole or at the center of this here, and imagine going all the way over to a. That corresponds to going from here to a over here. You pass through the domain wall, you pass through the domain wall over here. Just because I've doubled the diagram, you can think about it as going all the ways around. So going from uh, the pole all the ways around, reappearing over here and coming back here. But as I said, the official Penrose diagram would only be half of this. So Penrose diagram or conformal diagram, whatever you want to call it. It actually divides uh, things into several regions well, here, here they are. The decay region, in other words, the region here is this wedge over here. That's the bubble cosmology. This is the region of bubble cosmology, 
which is the remnant of the decay from the ancestor vacuum. We have just one wedge of we're, we're, we're diamond, this diamond over here. This is the domain wall. The domain wall comes in and goes back out, and that's it. That's, that is what the uh, updating your computer is almost complete. You must restart your computer for the updates to take effect. Do you want to restart your computer now? Thank you. Restart later. This will come up every five minutes now, won't it? Restart later. Okay, so that's a Coleman DeLuca instanton. Uh, the system has symmetry, and of course it's the symmetries which are the important uh, features that you want to preserve under any kind of uh, uh, changes in the system. You start with the four sphere, not this Coleman DeLuca instanton, but the four sphere embedded in five dimensions. That obviously has an O5 symmetry. Any four sphere, whether it's embedded in five dimensions or not, has an O5 symmetry. By slicing off the end of the sphere here and flattening it, you reduce the symmetry to the symmetry of three spheres. The three spheres are these red lines here, and the symmetry goes down to O4. Okay. It, uh, well, you can see what it does. The orbits of the O4 symmetry, the O4 symmetry acts on these circles, or really three spheres, and moves them around. And it's just the, uh, just the group which rotates around the three spheres. And that's the symmetry that's left over. You can ask, under analytic continuation, what happens to this O4 which is left over? How does it act on the coleman delucia instanton geometry, or the coleman delucia minkowski uh, version of it? And here's the way it acts. It's, first of all, not as O4. Not as O5 and O4, but as O4-1, that's the symmetry of the full de Sitter space, but the symmetry of the coleman delucci geometry is reduced to O3-1. Okay. O3-1 is the motions on the three-dimensional hyperbolic plane. Uh, here's how it acts. It acts along space-like directions in this wedge here, also in here, and in here, in this diamond, it acts in time-like directions. We won't be particularly interested in it. Likewise over here. And it acts back in space-like directions in here. But we're not going to be interested in here. We're interested in this region here. So this O31 acts as spatial translations and, uh, well, it acts on space-like surfaces inside this diamond. That's the important thing to keep track of, and it's a symmetry of the, uh, of the geometry. All right, now let me show you something else. Uh, I have put the center. This is, you can think of this as the origin of the domain wall. The domain wall is really over here, but uh, the critical bubble is very small, very small critical bubble. Domain wall just pretty much goes out along light-like directions. Here is where the uh, home and the lucha decay takes place. The bottom half of this is unphysical. The top half of it is the decay product of the instant time. Okay? That's the way instant times work. Half of them, you describe a bounce, but half of it uh, you throw away. And the upper half here is the tunneling out from the desitter into whatever it decays to. Okay, now this, has, this decay has taken place right at t equals zero. Of course, t decays can take place later earlier. How do you get them? Well, you just go back to the original diagram, rotate it, use one of the rotations that was broken by the symmetry. In any case, you can do a transformation which just takes the decay point and pushes it up toward t equals infinity or down near t equals at minus infinity. This would describe it. It's just a transform of the original diagram in which I pushed time upward so that the decay takes place right over here. All right. I've just chosen to throw, have the decay take place at a later time. Then you throw away the bottom half of the diagram, and that's the description in, in words of the mathematics that goes into describing the coleman delucia tunneling event, in this case from the sitter space to a, uh, to a configuration with zero cosmological constant. 
The tunneling event itself, of course, is quantum mechanical, and I can't really illustrate it in any serious way in terms of classical geometry. But if the tunneling process involves a very small critical bubble, then what the, the, the fuzz over here that you don't know how to think about classically is shrunk down to a very small distance, and it just represents uh, an outward-going bubble, which does that. The shape of the top of this here is controlled by the final cosmological constant. If the final cosmological constant is zero, then the shape of this are just light cones up here. As I said, if there are questions, please slow me down and stop me, because uh, I'm going a little bit fast, but that's OK. All right, here's a picture. Here's a blow up of the region of the decay region, and I told you before what the symmetry, how the symmetry acts on it. Yeah, let's go back a step. The symmetry acts on this, in this region here, as spatial translations, translations along these surfaces here. These surfaces are just surfaces of fixed time inside the bubble. Uh, some definitions. The vacuum that you decayed from I'll call the ancestor, and these points over here, which are really a two-sphere, this is a two-sphere from inside the geometry here. This is the two-sphere at infinity. It's the asymptotic sky, if you like, space-like infinity in this diagram here, uh, that an observer moving out along space-like surfaces, everybody would eventually get out to this point at space-like infinity. It's called sigma, and it's a two-sphere. Yeah. It's the Lorentz group. Yeah, that's the Lorentz group that are acting on hyperbolic, uh, well, that's it's Lorentz group. But it's acting on these surfaces here, which are hyperboloids, okay, which are uh, uniformly curved hyperboloids. All right, so uh, let's take a look at one of these space-like sections here. It is the uniformly curved, negatively curved uh, uh, hyperboloid. What do you call it? The, the, um, <laughs> the uniformly negatively curved surface. All right, so I've shown this. I use this picture in every talk I ever give. I love it so much, and it just illustrates so beautifully what negative curvature is about. Uh, this is Escher's limit circle number four, sometimes called angels and devils. And it is a mapping of the uniform negative curve surface. It is a conformal diagram. It's purely space-like purely space-like, and of course, by definition, every angel has the same size as every other angel. So the metric is clearly diverging near the boundary, and metrical distance on here is basically just counting angels and devils, or just counting, uh, counting along here. The, uh, the metric diverges at infinity. That's the hyperbolic plane. Uh, here, is, here is the metric of the FRW region that I drew like this. I neglected to tell you that this region is an FRW geometry, friedman robertson walker geometry, and its metric, this is the space-time metric of it, is the S squared. Now, I'm working with conformal time. That's why the A of T comes out of the whole expression here. A of T squared, capital T is conformal time, related to ordinary proper time by uh, simple transformation. A of t squared times minus dt squared plus h plus the metric on h3. h3 is the hyperbolic three-dimensional geometry, the three-dimensional analog of the Escher drawing here. So this is it. And the h3, if you want to know what it is, is it's just the r squared, where r is the radial proper distance along uh, from, the, uh, from the center of the disk. The r squared plus not r squared the omega squared, but cinch squared r the omega squared. Now, this is polar coordinates. Omega is the two sphere, the unit two sphere, and this is like polar coordinates, except that the uh, size of the two sphere grows exponentially. I think you all know this. And each one of these space like slices here is a geometry of exactly this form. Okay, so that's what the, that's what the uh, cosmology looks like. The O31 
acts in the bulk here as spatial translations to the extent that translations exist on a hyperbolic plane. Things which move around the center, or sorry, translations are things which move around the center, and rotations are things which keep the center fixed. But they're just the transformations which move around the angels and devils uh, with a symmetry. The same symmetry can act on the boundary. When it acts on the boundary, it acts as conformal transformations. Conformal transformations on the boundary of this. Now remember what the boundary is. The boundary was the thing that I called sigma which is asymptotic space-like infinity. So it says that the transformations, the symmetry transformations, move points around on space-like infinity according to the conformal group. Conformal group, everybody hears conformal group, and says, aha, ADS-CFP. Well, not quite, but... Uh, but note that H3, or any hyperbolic plane, is the same as the Euclidean version of anti de Sitter space in that same number of dimensions. Okay? So each spatial slice has the properties of Euclidean anti de Sitter space, the boundary of the anti de Sitter space just being the edge of this plane here. So maybe that should light you up a little bit and say, well, what can we do with that? Okay, I'll come back to it. Let me discuss another concept. I'm going through some concepts quickly, just to have a language. Uh, the census taker, but before I do that, I had better tell this thing not to restart the computer again. I hope it doesn't do it faster and faster. It won't do that, will it? Okay. All right, what is a census taker? The census taker is just another word for an observer in this region here. Uh, I don't know, at Stanford we started calling it the census taker because we imagined somebody looking back along their past or within their past light cone and counting things. Counting angels and devils, counting civilizations, counting galaxies or whatever. Uh-oh, it is going faster and faster. It's unable to secure communication path with the pre-boot security subsystem. Please reboot. And it, look, I'm not going to do this. Somebody, I, I, I'll blow the guts out of the computer. What do I do? Oh, oh, it's not coming out of here, is it? Just ignore it. Yeah, OK. All right, good. I won't even look at it. All right, so the census taker is just an observer, a time-like observer, who eventually arrives up at the tippy tip of the diagram. The tippy tip of the diagram is t equals infinity. So eventually arrives up here, looks back, and can see more and more of each one of these space-like surfaces. As census taker time goes on, along the census taker's world line, he gets to see more and more of these space-like surfaces. Okay. So that, uh, that's the notion of a census taker, just a counter of things. But I'm mainly going to be interested in this past light cone, the green lines. Ah, no. But they're not going to let me do it. I don't know what to do. It doesn't, it, it's not giving me the option. Uh, let's see, maybe I, can, maybe I can close it down. Wait, maybe I can close it down. No, it won't even let me close it down. OK, so while somebody, is somebody going to get somebody? Because I don't know what to do. Uh, are there questions? No questions. Yeah, let's, let's slow. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, it takes, it takes every point into another point. If you're on the boundary, it takes points to boundary points. If you're in the bulk, it can move you around in the bulk. Uh, this, of course, is exactly the same mathematics as the, the, the anti de Sitter group, which moves around points in the interior of anti de Sitter space. And it also has a direct reflection on the boundary of anti de Sitter space moving points. And it's on the boundary that it's conformal transformations. Uh, I apologize for Perimeter Institute. Mm 
uh, I said before that what I'm imagining now is the decay to a supersymmetric vacuum with lambda equal to zero. Is what? Supersymmetry is broken in the ancestor vacuum here. That will leave remnants of supersymmetry breaking in here, which will fade away at late times. So it's only at late times that it really matters whether the cosmological constant is zero or not. Uh, and it is believed that, in, at least in string theory, that there are vacuums with zero cosmological constant. So how we use this is another question. Uh, that I that I have intended to discuss, but I, I wanted to discuss the conceptual background first. Uh, I suppose I'm inclined to think of them as existing all along the line, uh, and. Uh, That's good. Wait, is this, is this, wait, which one is this that's hooked up now? Um, which, either one? This one. This one, okay, good. All right, so there, there we are. That was faster than I thought it was gonna be. All right, so now, let's, uh, let's go back and look at one of these surfaces. What does this look like? The evolution of the census taker's past light cone. That's what I'm interested in. In other words, what the census taker sees when he looks back along his light cone of the hyperbolic plane. And it's clear what happens is the census taker sees a ring, or really a sphere, a two-sphere, which moves out from the center and with census taker time gets closer and closer to the boundary. Now, for anybody who knows anything about ads -CFP, this should ring a bell. What does it mean to be moving out along this radial trajectory with a two-sphere like this well, it's clearly connected with some kind of renormalization group flow, uh, where as you move out, what you're seeing is smaller and smaller angular structures along here, smaller and smaller angular structures in ADS, would translate into the statement that what you're seeing is deeper and deeper into the ultraviolet of the boundary theory. Now, so far, we haven't established that there's any kind of boundary theory, and uh, I just, uh, this at the moment is an analogy. But it's a suggestive analogy that uh, census taker time evolution, looking back along his light cone, generates a kind of renormalization group flow in which he can see finer and finer detail on the, uh, on the boundary sphere. Okay, let me just remind you a little more about ADS and its renormalization group flow. No, no details. I'm not going to get into technical details. Uh, the radial direction of ADS, now we're talking about ADS. The radial direction is a kind of stand-in, at least it's a coarse-grained a coarse -grained radial direction. We've got to coarse-grain it over, the, over a certain radius, the ADS radius. But when it's coarse grained sufficiently, it morphs into the renormalization group parameter, the renormalization group scale uh, of the boundary field theory. This is sufficiently well known that I'm mostly reminding you of things. Here's the way I like to think about the renormalization group flow. First of all, you don't have to think, you, what you're going to do is you're going to replace the boundary sphere where the true ultraviolet theory lives, you're going to replace it by a sphere which has been pulled in from the boundary a little bit. That's regularizing. That regularizes the infrared of the, uh, of the ADS geometry, and it regularizes the ultraviolet of the boundary description. That infrared ultraviolet is connection is well known. There's no reason why you have to take perfect spheres to do this. You can take geometries which have arbitrary shape and then push them out to the boundary. And in fact, we can define an R, the distance to this surrogate boundary here, which depends on omega. I want to do that. I want to keep free 
the omega dependence, omega is the point on the two sphere, the position dependence of the cutoff scale. So we're doing field theory with a position dependent cutoff scale. Omega is the sphere out here. And as I said, what is a infrared cutoff in the bulk becomes an ultraviolet cutoff in, uh, in the boundary field theory. Okay, I'm going to call the metric on this sphere here. Now, this is not a real sphere in the geometry. It's a reference sphere. It's a renormalization scale that you use the same way you use a renormalization scale in field theory. It's a pure reference thing. There's no content to it. We're not, re we're not really cutting off the system. We're just renormalizing it at that scale. Uh, we're setting boundary conditions on that scale, but there's nothing really going on there. Uh, we'll call the metric on the sphere the reference metric. Right? And what is it? It's just given by on the sphere, sinh squared r. Then remember, this, this is what came into the metric on the sphere. Sinh squared r, the omega squared. I've just written the metric of the hyperbolic disk and then pulled it back to this, to this uh, warped sphere here so that r becomes a position-dependent uh, position thing. All right, with this definition, what we're doing as we push that surface out is we're making the geometry bigger and bigger and bigger. Making the geometry bigger and bigger and bigger, we can be imagining keeping the renormalization group scale, the renormalization scale fixed. You have two things, you, the two ways you can think about renormalization. One of them is you can think about smaller and smaller scales keeping the geometry fixed. The other way is keep the scale fixed and make the geometry bigger and bigger and bigger. Okay? Uh, here, what we're doing is making the geometry bigger and bigger and bigger by pushing R out to the boundary and keeping the renormalization scale, in other words, the size, the cutoff scale, if you like, the subtraction point, we're keeping it fixed. That's a useful way in ADS to think about renormalization. The, the sphere goes out uh, and you keep fixed the ultraviolet scale, and you keep it fixed at the ABS radius, basically, unit radius. In here. All right, so that's, that's connection between renormalization group and radial uh, position. All of this then raises the question, is there an analog of ADS CFP that applies to the FRW geometry in the decay product of a coleman volusia instant time? Uh, the sphere at infinity is a strictly Euclidean sphere. The sphere at infinity has not got a time-like direction in it. It's just a Euclidean sphere. And so if there is a correspondence, it will be with the Euclidean theory on the boundary. And so I ask the question now. Here we come back to the original question that I oh, was interested in. If R is the renormalization group parameter, along this hyperbolic plane in the same way as it is in ADS-CFP, what is time? If the dual description of this coleman delucia instant time geometry is a pure Euclidean conformal field theory on a boundary sphere, then what the hell is time? Where does time come into the game? That's mainly what I wanted to, uh, to show you. So before I do, we need a few concepts. One concept is time as scale factor. Time as scale factor is known to practitioners of Wheeler-DeWitt theory, very well known. I will remind you of it if you don't know. I, I can't remind you if you don't know. I will remind you if you do know. Okay. Um, let's see. Let me. Yeah. Okay. Let me draw. The, let me put this picture in first. What we're going to be doing is thinking about Wheeler-DeWitt wave functions as applied to the universe inside this patch. The natural way to do it is to pin the space-like surfaces down at sigma here and imagine that they can be moved up and down and then apply the Wheeler-DeWitt logic to the wave function on such a surface. The Wheeler-DeWitt wave function is a wave function that depends only on the space components of the metric, not on the space time or time time components of the metric, number one. It also depends on whatever other fields, fundamental fields, are on the slice. 
But what it doesn't depend on is time. There is no time in the Wheeler DeWitt formalism. It has to be, it has to emerge. Okay? Let's come back. All right. So the, let's assume there's some Wheeler DeWitt wave function. The measure for, I would say probabilities, except I'm going to get myself in trouble if I call them probabilities. The measure is just psi star psi, where psi is a function of the space like components of the metric and f. There is no time, but the wave function does depend on the scale factor. It depends on the scale factor uh, through its dependence on the space components of the metric. The scale factor, I will just define, it's basically the, uh, the volume of the geometry. All right, so the volume, well, yeah, it's basically just the volume of the geometry. The scale factor increases with time in an FRW expanding geometry. And time becomes a surrogate kind of, uh, uh, that is to say, the scale factor replaces time in the wheeler dewitt equation. You can think of the wheeler dewitt wave function as a function of the scale factor and everything else. And what's known, rather easy to demonstrate, is that the large A limit of the wheeler dewitt equation, the Hamiltonian constraint, just becomes the Schrodinger equation for everything else with A replacing time. So in that rather trivial sense, time emerges from a wheeler dewitt wave function which has no explicit time dependence. You can also define a local scale factor, namely just as the square root of the determinant of the space component of the metric, and think of that as a local time. That was uh, something that uh, John Wheeler liked very much. He called it many-fingered time. Okay, so in, and uh, this is a useful concept for later. So here's an example where time emerges from the formalism without being explicitly put into the formalism. And as I said, the Schrodinger equation with all the right I's and everything else appears as the limiting behavior of the Wheeler-DeWitt equation for large A when the scale factor gets large. Okay, so what question is what would happen if you applied this to uh, the setup that we've been discussing? Now, before I do, what I want to say is this, is this description is a throwback to a way of thinking about quantum mechanics and gravity, which personally I don't believe. I don't believe it because it's making use too heavily of both concepts. And one of the lessons that we've learned is that a good quantum theory of gravity should be holographic. In other words, it should be something which takes place on the boundary of a system, just like ADS-CFP. The precise description that we have is the boundary description. The bulk description, uh, we don't know if it can ever be made precise. Nobody has ever made it precise. The boundary description is quite precise. And so what I would suggest is that we imagine a holographic version of this Wheeler-DeWitt formalism in which the degrees of freedom are really imagined to be localized far away on the boundary of space. In other words, just as we do in ADS, get substitute for all the degrees of freedom in the bulk, a collection of a large number of degrees of freedom on the boundary. Psi depends on boundary degrees of freedom. That's the proposal. Uh, I think by now, it, uh, there's very good evidence for it, but I, I may not get to it today. All right, so that's, that's the idea. We have boundary degrees of freedom, which are stand-ins for the bulk degrees of freedom. Well, maybe they really are more precise than the bulk degrees of freedom. And they live on the boundary of these space-like surfaces. Just as in ADS, it can be profitable sometimes to pull the boundary in a little bit to regulate it, to regulate both the ultraviolet of the, uh, of the dual theory and the infrared of the bulk theory, I'm going to pull the boundary in a little bit. Do that. Remember, previously in ADS, I defined an R of omega. Now I have to define not just an R of omega, but a T of omega. So this boundary now is defined by an R of omega and a T of omega. That's the character of such a boundary. And that is where degrees of freedom are. 
Where does this time emerge from? What is this time that I've put here? How does it emerge out of a conformal, a Euclidean conformal field theory on the boundary? That's the question. How can it emerge? What mechanisms are there? All right, so now I've come to tell you that time in this description is a Liouville field. It's a Liouville field. What is a Liouville field? Let's go back a minute. No, let's not go back. It's a Liouville field. It's a Liouville field describing the, bo the boundary geometry. It's pretty much the same thing as saying the scale factor replaces time in the bulk description. The boundary description also has a geometry. The boundary of the geometry is also something that needs to be specified or need to be integrated over in general. And the boundary geometry is defined in terms of a Liouville field, which is like the scale factor. It's basically the scale factor on the boundary. And it seems, well, it seems plausible that time on the boundary of the boundary description would be replaced by a Liouville degree of freedom. So let's see how that works. Uh, I realize I'm jumping around. The problem with the seminar is there were too many little pieces that I know that some of you may know, but uh, some of you may not know. So what I wanted to do before jumping into time as Liouville field was to tell you a little bit about the intuitive mathematics, just very little, just what, the things I absolutely need, minimum things I need. Uh, what is Liouville, and how is it connected to geometry? Uh, the application of Liouville theory to string theory is, of course, well known, and, but it dates back much further than most of you know. I think it dates back to a paper by myself and, uh, and Holger Nielsen uh, when we were interested in string theory around 1969 or 1970, and we were starting to think of strings as somehow the description of very dense, very complicated planar Feynman diagrams. Uh, we didn't know why the diagram should be planar. Tuft hadn't done his, uh, his uh, large end theory yet. And we simply postulated, for some unknown reason, uh, strings or the world sheet was really just nothing but a very large, dense, planar Feynman diagram. In other words, it was a triangulation of a two-dimensional space. And summing over those planar Feynman diagrams would be the same as summing over the geometry of a complicated network, which we called, which Hover called a fishnet. And uh, the vertices of the fishnet, of course, are the vertices of the Feynman diagram. And the way we thought about this is that every such fishnet has a natural geometry that's associated with it. The natural geometry is defined in the following way. You first lay the geometry down, you, you lay the fishnet down. Let's say it's a fishnet with the topology of a sphere. You lay it down on the sphere according to a rule. And the rule is that it should be locally isotropic. OK, I'm not going to define exactly what locally isotropic is. But I'm just going to say that wherever you are in this fishnet, it more or less looks locally, rotationally invariant. And I tried to draw it in such a way that, uh, that any given one of these vertices more or less has uh, rotational invariance around it. Incidentally, that's equivalent to the conformal gauge in, in geometry. You lay it down arbitrarily except, uh, except consistent with this rule of local isotropy. Then, once you've done that, there's a lattice spacing. And the lattice spacing will depend on position on this sphere. In general, the lattice spacing, there'll be big holes, small holes. Once you've laid it down, the lattice spacing, which is A here, will depend on position. Define a metric by the S squared equals the omega squared, that's just the ordinary metric on the sphere, times the inverse lattice spacing squared. With this metric, the distance between any pair of neighboring lattice sites is 1. So this is a metric in which the distance between lattice sites is 1. And it is, if you like, the natural metric that you identify with a fitness. So having done that, that's the first step in defining the theory. The second step 
is to introduce a reference fishnet. This fishnet is one we're going to have to integrate over. We're going to sum diagrams, or we're going to sum over geometries. So this fishnet is a dynamical fishnet that gets summed over, describing some dynamical geometry. We don't know how to do field theory on a variable geometry. So the trick is to introduce, this is what Leoville theory does. You introduce a fixed background fishnet. It's fixed. It's not going to vary. All right, you fix it once and for all, and it's a reference fishnet. It's a reference fishnet which defines a reference metric in the same way that the original fishnet defined what's called the true metric. You define a reference metric, which is the reference metric of these, of these larger, or, or more coarse-grained metric. And these points are frozen. They are not integrated over. They just define a background on which you define field theory. Uh, what you do is you average the local real fishnet degrees of freedom over regions comparable in size to the, uh, to the uh, larger fishnet space. And you can do this in a variety of ways. There's many ways to do it. One way to do it is to define the dual lattice, uh, or to think of this lattice as uh, the dual to some other lattice. And then the vertices of, the, of one lattice are the are the surfaces of the other lattice, and then just average over the surfaces. But there's lots of ways to do it. But you refer averages over the original geometry. You refer them to degrees of freedom at the sites of the more coarse green reference geometry. That's what Leoville theory is. It's a field theory on the reference geometry that's doing the same job as averaging over the geometry uh, on a smaller size scale. A three-normalization group, a three-normalization group, but of a specific kind. What is the Leoville field? The Leoville field is just a ratio of these two metrics. In other words, it's the real metric as expressed in terms of the reference metric. We could write it BS squared, the real metric, as E to the 2U, that's definition, e to the 2u. It's actually just the ratio of these things here, times the r squared. u is the Leoville field. This is the reference metric. This is the real metric. That's what Leoville theory does, is it takes a sum over geometries and makes a field theory out of it. It's the field theory of this u here, this u degree of freedom. And it becomes a path integral over a fixed a fixed metric, the metric no longer wobbles. That's it. That's what Leoville theory is. Okay, now let's go back to FRW. Am I going way ahead of everybody or am I being clear? I can't tell. Well, if I'm being clear, then I'll just, I'll just keep going. Okay. Let's come back now to the FRW. Having told you what Leoville theory does, let me come back to the FRW and in particular the boundary far away of FRW. Here again is the, the FRW. When I say FRW, I'm thinking about the geometry associated with coleman deluccia instant pond. Here is this metric again with some A of t, which is determined by dynamics. I'm interested in the two-sphere far away, so let me just throw away the parts of the metric that have to do with time and radial distance. Here is the metric associated with the distant two-sphere that has coefficient uh, dr squared there. Uh, I think I didn't do anything between these two. Yeah, I just threw away that. Yeah. Moved it over. <laughs> that's, that's the metric of the two sphere far away. But now I'll just change the definition. Instead of calling this A of T squared, oh, this, uh, this is scale factor. Incidentally, I think I pulled A two things. One was the lattice spacing and one was scale factor. They're two different things. I'm sorry, I apologize for that. But now let's just replace a of t squared by something that I call e to the 2u. It's just definition. e to the 2u. And this is the metric now on the two-sphere far away, but it's the two-sphere which is not the two-sphere at fixed radial distance or at fixed time, but at variable radial distance as you go around it and intersecting a variable time which depends on omega. In other words, this is the metric of a distant two-sphere, space-like two-sphere, 
which is defined by an R of omega and a T of omega. And I've called T, or I've called A of T, E to the 2 U of omega. That's just the metric of a distant surface, and it comes in two factors. The two factors, the first factor here looks exactly like the reference metric of the ADS construction. This was the same exact reference metric that I would use for ADS right, times something which looks like a Liouville field. So the metric of a distance sphere of a particular distance sphere far away at a fixed time can be replaced by the metric of a Liouville kind of theory where the Liouville scale factor, this is the scale factor far away, where the Liouville scale factor replaces time. The logic is exactly the same as in Wheeler DeWitt. And so my claim is that time will emerge if there is a Liouville, this degree of freedom, on the boundary of the hyperbolic plane. That's the difference between ADS and this, AD and this um, FRW construction that the FRW construction has a Liouville field to integrate over. And it's just time. It's just time on the boundary. So the metric divides into two pieces, Liouville and reference metric. All right, uh, let me tell you a little more about Liouville dynamics. Shall I slow down? No, OK. Let me tell you a little more about Liouville dynamics and show you how, uh, how various things come out. First of all, Liouville dynamics, as I said, is a way of summing over surfaces. Summing over surfaces, some people call two-dimensional gravity, two-dimensional Euclidean gravity. That's fine. You can call it that if you like, even though there's no gravity. Uh, but you can call it that. The requirement of um, coordinate invariance, of diffeomorphism invariance, requires a constraint on the central charges of the Liouville theory we're thinking now about Liouville theory coupled to some matter degrees of freedom. Now, I don't mean real matter. I mean matter degrees of freedom in the same sense that ADS has degrees of freedom which are gauge fields. They're not things which live in the bulk. They're things that live on the boundary. We're imagining now the Liouville dynamics, whatever it is, involves a matter sector coupled to some kind of Liouville sector. The matter sector would be more like the gauge degrees of freedom of ADS. The Liouville sector is the extra new thing that's there because we have to describe time. All right, this is a constraint which is necessary. These are the central charges, the matter theory central charge and the Liouville central charge. Uh, the real constraint is that the total central charge of a Liouville theory which is intended to be describing surfaces, surfaces with fields of some sort on them, that the total central charge has to add up to zero. That's the constraint of, uh, of coordinate events. Well known by string theorists to add ghosts in and things to make so total central charge zero. You do whatever has to be done. Central charge must be add up to zero. All right, I will tell you later that the C of the matter theory is nothing but the entropy of the background of the city space, of the ancestor of the city space. You cannot see that now. Uh, if we have ch a chance, I'll show you how we prove that. But it is known what the matter field of central charge is, and it's the ancestor entropy, the entropy of the background of the city space. In other words, it's expected to be large and positive. Uh, and we don't know what the cosmological constant of the ancestor is, but let's just suppose we're in a semi-classical domain where the radius of the, anti uh, of the ancestor is much larger than Planck, then this is a large positive number. And the result is that the central charge of the Liouville sector must be negative and large. Negative and large uh, should tell you something else. Large, negative, Liouville central charge means that the Liouville field is time-like. It means that it has a negative kinetic term. Negative kinetic term, the Liouville field has a Lagrangian, which looks like this. The hat here indicates Dalembertian in the reference metric. This is the reference metric curvature. And this is the Lagrangian of the Liouville theory. And it comes in with a large negative central charge. 
It's this large negative central charge which makes it possible to identify Liouville with time life instead of space life. Okay, let's uh, let's pursue it. There is another term. This this here. It doesn't matter what it is. It's it's the kinetic term of Liouville. There's a potential piece which goes as the curvature of the background reference metric, and there's a term which is called the two-dimensional cosmological constant. Yeah. Yeah, it should be CL. Sorry. No, it should be it should be CN. CN. Yeah. Okay. CL is negative. It should be it should be plus CL. Right. Right. Thank you. Yeah, it should be plus CM. It should be plus C is a positive quantity, minus C is a negative. Yeah. All right. Another thing that's usually thrown at the Liouville theory is a two dimensional cosmological constant. This is a two dimensional cosmological constant. Square root of G times e to the 2u is just a volume uh, element, and lambda is a two dimensional cosmological constant. Okay, what is this two dimensional cosmological constant? Does it have anything to do with the cosmological constant in the bulk? No, nothing at all. Uh, is it a new parameter in the theory? No, it is not a new parameter in the theory. I will tell you now what it is. The way to discover what it is is to solve Liouville theory with this cosmological constant. You can find a homogeneous solution, a solution in which these gradients of the Liouville field vanish just by playing off this term against this term. There is a saddle point. The saddle point is only there when this is a minus sign. It is not there for plus sign. So with a large negative central charge, you're in a semi-classical region of this, uh, because the central charge is large. You can solve it, and you can find the classical geometry that's associated with a given lambda. And that classical geometry, not too surprisingly, is a sphere. What else could it be? It's a sphere. It's a uniform sphere, two-sphere. It's a uniform two-sphere whose geometry, its geometry, its radius is determined by the Liouville field. The Liouville field is metric. Its metrical size gets bigger and bigger as lambda goes to zero. If we identify this Liouville field with time, as it's suggested, then the connection between the time and the cosmological constant is just that this e, uh, uh, it's a of t. This should read a of t. a of t is just equal to square root of lambda. In other words, what this cosmological constant is, is it's a Lagrange multiplier that you put into the theory that scans time. Go back for a minute to wheeler DeWitt. I told you before that uh, the scale factor is the stand-in for time. How would you do wheeler it if you wanted to freeze the time at every instant and see what was going on? Well, one way would just be to freeze the, uh, the, uh, uh, the scale factor. Another way would be to put a Lagrange multiplier in for the action to freeze the scale factor at a certain size. That's what this is doing. This lambda here is simply a Lagrange multiplier that allows you to zero in on a particular value of the Liouville field, or equivalently, a particular value of the time. You scan time in this theory by varying lambda. Let me come back to this. Let me, uh, let me point out something now. I think we have the basic idea of where time comes from in this description, but I can say it another way. There are two. Does everybody want to go? No, I want to ask you about oh, sorry. Yeah. Oh, or, or what was our hat? I thought our hat was going to be one. Or that was your reference. No, no, our hat, our hat is the curvature of the um, reference. No. Of the reference metric. And the reference metric uh, is whatever I want it to be. The answers, the answers will be invariant against changes of the reference metric. Okay. And it always just gives a sphere. But the reference metric itself, it will give a true sphere. The reference metric itself does not have to define the sphere. It can have a sphere with lumps on it. Okay. Right? But when you solve the Liouville equation, the answer is always a uniform sphere. In other words, the product of the reference metric and the Liouville field will always give you the uniform sphere. And I think that's probably what you were asking about. That's for negative C. Hmm? For negative C. 
the negative C. For positive C, it just wants to shrink to a point. The, uh, uh, the geometry, at least with, with a spherical, with a spherical topology, allowing it to shrink to a point. With a uh, negatively curved topology, it can, uh, it, uh, it, there is a solid point. But with a positively curved, in other words, we're talking about the sphere in the sky. We want to have a growing sphere. That growing sphere just corresponds to the observations of the census taker as he looks out and sees a bigger and bigger sphere. And what, in this formalism, what's tuning that sphere is the cosmological constant, the, the two dimensional cosmological constant. If you like. Ooh. What would we do? I don't know what we would do. Um, I guess I don't know how non-critical string theorists think about non-critical string theory. Um, <laughs> perhaps that's what they do, I don't know. But here, <laughs> the way I discovered this cosmological constant, I knew that Leoville theory had a cosmological constant, but I said, I don't want it, I'll just throw it away. And uh, then I got interested in trying to find a device for tuning the time in the path integral by, you know, by, have, by having it be concentrated at some particular scale factor. And let's fill in it. Let's fill in a Lagrange multiplier, and I worked out the Lagrangian with the Lagrange multiplier, and of course it was just the cosmological constant term uh, that was the Lagrange multiplier. So I would say it's a Lagrange multiplier that you tune, or that you scan, to allow the system to scan different times. Uh, no, you don't integrate over it. You fix it, but then you change it if you want to get to a later time and a later time and a later time. So that kind of solves the puzzle of how renormalization group generates an extra time, an extra, an, an extra variable. There are, if you like, a two-dimensional plane, if you like, determined one dimension being R, and R is just the reference scale. You can study how things vary with the reference scale, and that's called conventional renormalization group. There's also another parameter, lambda, or the expectation value of phi after you put the Lagrange multiplier into freeze it, not phi, you, same thing. That's the other direction, and moving around in this plane Changing the reference scale and changing lambda is what generates the two dimensions of time and radial distance. That's the, uh, that's the extra origin of the extra di direction. So um, I find that interesting. I find that more than interesting. I find it an exciting idea that time can be generated in cosmology uh, it's not that time can be generated so much that uh, that excites me. What excites me about it is that there's a formalism here, uh, which um, is new, it's new and some new duality, some new uh, connections. All right, let me ch uh, let's see. No, we did that. Let's see. No, here we are. Uh, I won't go through the calculation of the central charge. The calculation of the central charge, which is the ancestor an an entropy, I would do. Yeah, on the blackboard for you, but not today. So if you like, I, uh, we, can, uh, we can go a little bit further, and I can show you some of the computation, the real computations that were done. But I'll tell, you how, I'll tell you how it was done. You calculate correlation functions in the CDL and the coleman belucha background, and then you analytically uh, extrapolate them to the Minkowski, and then you extrapolate them to the boundary. The graviton co uh, correlators become the energy momentum tensor on the boundary theory. You calculate two-point functions, three-point functions, and do all the tricks that operator product expansions tell you to do to compute a central charge from matrix elements of an energy momentum tensor, and you read off the, uh, the central charge of the theory. Central charge turns out to be the entropy of the ancestor vacuum. Now, I have to say, at the moment, our computation has a factor of two in it. I can't remember if it's twice the ancestor entropy or a half the ancestor entropy. There's also some pies, but I mean, relative, it, it seems to differ by a factor of two from what I would have wanted it to be. 
that uh, may go away, I don't know, but it's of order of magnitude, the ancestor entropy within a factor of two. So that, uh, that seems to work out pretty well. And if, therefore, it's probably large and positive, the entropy of the ancestor, if it's very small, we have no reason to be doing semi-classical physics altogether. Okay, let me just finish by suggesting something. This is, this is, much of what I have told you has been confirmed by the detailed calculations of correlation functions. We don't know exactly what the answer, what the, uh, what the conformal field theory description is, but for example, that there's an energy momentum tensor that's conserved, traceless, and so forth on the boundary. Those things have been confirmed by calculating uh, bulk correlators and extrapolating them. Now it gets very speculative. At this point, people always say, okay, now tell us really what is the fundamental theory. What is the conformal field theory that's coupled to the Liouville theory? My guess is that it is not really a Liouville theory coupled to matter, but that it's a simple matrix theory. A matrix theory, a matrix integral, not even a matrix quantum mechanics. It doesn't have time. Whatever it is, it doesn't have time. Uh, time has to come out of it. And my guess is that it's simply a matrix integral. Uh, I have little evidence for that except for some naive observations, not so naive, but some observations that mostly come, that entirely come from the past. So let me just state them and tell you what I think. Let MA be, this is the M of uh, the original slide, let MA be, be a collection of N by N Hermitian matrices. Okay. They're labeled by what I suppose you could call a flavor index, namely I, and there's going to be a large number of them. Uh, a and B will go from 1 to N, capital N. And that's going to be very large. In fact, we're going to go to the large N limit. Why do we go to the large N limit? Because we want planar diagrams. But the index I is some finite index. And how big is it? Well, it can go from 1 roughly to the entropy of the ancestor. Okay. If you were to take a conventional matrix integral, not a path integral, just a conventional matrix integral, integral over matrices, and expand them in powers of the potential. The potential could be five to the fourth, or m to the fourth, m to the sixth, whatever you like, even m cubed it could contain, uh, and so forth. And you expand it, you will get some vertices, and you will get some Feynman diagrams. The Feynman diagrams will involve vertices which couple the various flavors together. For each coupling of the, here's the first, second, and third flavors coupled together. Let's call that vertex purple. The fifth, ninth, and fifteenth, some other coupling constant may govern it. Let's call it blue. There will be a whole variety of different vertices that depend on the flavor indices, but when you go to work out the path integral, this path, not path integral, but this integration, of course, you will expand in powers of V and generate Feynman diagrams. What will those Feynman diagrams be? Those Feynman diagrams will be the planar Feynman diagrams of large N theory, but decorated with different kinds of vertices, depending on who's coming in, which flavor is coming in, which flavor is going out. There will be a large variety of different kinds of vertices. The vertices, well, the mesh defines a Liouville geometry. The vertices, the labeling of them, define fields on this geometry. You can think of those fields as matter fields. Uh, this kind of thing is well known to people who do uh, matrix theories and uh, matrix uh, integrals and so forth. Uh, one example is generating the icing model on a, uh, on a curve, on a, um, on a quantum gravity background the icing model being ups and down vertices. You can generate a wide, wide variety of field theories living on such a mesh by simply varying the couplings, the nature of the couplings among the, uh, the flavors. So my best guess is that this theory is really a matrix integral. Yeah. I'm finished. Thank <laughs> <laughs>
infinite. That's my best guess, that this theory is a uh, matrix integral and not even, not even the quantum account, it's just a matrix integral. We will see.